I want to present um, Marina Adamovic. She is a curator of this festival. And um, Anna Cherepnin, she is a creative director. Right in Milena. So let's start. Um, this year, the 13th Independent Documentary Film Festival in New York, Ruth Dog Film Fest, uh, has concluded. Uh, over 30 documentaries were screened under the programs Three World, Eternal Values, and Fresh Look. Uh, the films were created with support from independent studios and uh, producers from eight countries. The online theater and internet promotional materials allowed us to attract uh, to the festival activities and screenings over 25,000 people in, two, in 10 countries. Uh, it will use... Uh, of all ages, all oh. nationalities, uh, different political views, and different uh, social backgrounds. The reason why we presented more documentaries uh, in this uh, year program uh, than in previous year was very hard general situation for documentary cinema uh, during the pandemic. Uh, including the reducing possibilities uh, to screen uh, their uh, works. Um, it was especially important to the uh, uh, festival and to us to come back to a Manhattan-based theater. It's important to declare that we are alive and uh, we uh, are able to revive our city, New York, uh, after two years of pandemic. And I would like to greet you uh, to the organizer and supporter of the festival. Um, only using with this uh, support, their help uh, and their enthusiasm, we can uh, survive and we can revive uh, uh, our uh, city. Um, so, uh, we screened uh, 14 documentaries uh, under the program of the Free World, uh, and 10 of them uh, were awarded. Iman laureates are, are two films dedicated to the memory of the Holocaust survivors, and two documentaries uh, dedicated to the Armenian genocide. The film director, Darin Havanisyan, was awarded with the Humanitarian Award with a uh, biopic truth to power about famous hard rock musician and civil activist uh, Serge uh, Tankian. This award is a recognition of the special contribution uh, of preserving and developing um, the humanitarian values and uh, uh, the award could be a film, a film project or a person. Um, then we presented another uh, films about civil rights activists uh, under this social program uh, from Russia. Uh, film Politzek is the new black film director Konstantin Davidkin, young film director. Uh, he was awarded special jury prize and we presented two more remarkable films about uh, uh, Russia in 90s, uh, 1990s, the Sakharov case. Um, this uh, film was awarded uh, with uh, Faces of Russia and uh, the second uh, documentary, List of the New Perspective, uh, this film was awarded with Grand Prix, the Festival Grand Prix. Um, oh, I see Lucy, and <laughs> I hope that Lucy, as a member of uh, this year uh, festival jury, can uh, comment uh, all this information and uh, to tell more oh. and better about our, I do say, about our awardees and. Uh, about the jury works during this very hard pandemic time uh, with very uh, <coughs> huge uh, program, festival program. So uh, 
maybe in uh, uh, Anna Cherepnin uh, will continue to, to tell a few words about uh, two other programs, uh, uh, Eternal Value and a Fresh Look. And now uh, Anna Cherepnin, creative director of the festival, please uh, give us a little speech. Because of pandemic and the COVID-19, which happened last year, and that was a very, um, so that, that was a very difficult time for everybody. So we had to rethink uh, the festival um, a little bit and to adjust to the uh, contemporary times. So we created uh, three programs. And uh, so one, uh, one program this year was the Free World, which Marina talked about. And uh, another one, values. So we uh, we think that uh, this is a very important program because the uh, uh, culture is very important, and uh, we um, um, so we had to um, to create this program. And in the, within the frames of the program, we had uh, twelve films that participated from uh, um, Russia, uh, Chile, um, and uh, uh, America. Uh, so the another program was um, a fresh look um, because of the emerging uh, technologies and uh, um, we uh, decided to uh, create it and to involve more young people to submit their works in a, di in a different digital formats and uh, with the usage of um, new languages of cinema. So I know that Nazaretskaya, uh, um, mm. so she will be, she, she, she was supposed to participate in the round table mm. uh, because her film Magdalena uh, got the award for the best short film under five minutes. And um, so uh, the program was very interesting and uh, this is what... Um, mm. It was... One important thing, I, sometimes I was taking images from, from television screen, uh, a news mm -hmm. factor. This is important, this, this, this is important thing. Um, uh, what is documentary film? To me, I was trying, I was asking myself, is this an art or it's a journalism? Uh, because if it's art, you, you have a license to experiment and do your, your things. If it's a journalist, then you have to be very objective. You have to present both sides. So when, when I was taking images from TV screen, they're always the same to show how many cases, how many deaths, and, and to see the, in, uh, how it was going on. It was increasing all the time. So, <laughs> so some people, prefer to watch CNN, some MSNBC, some Fox News, right? So I decided it would be, uh, it would be wrong if I will show only those channels I like personally. So I decided to show them all. The Fox mm -hmm. News, the CNN, MSNBC, and ABC sometimes, uh, sometimes just to be, just to be fair. That, that was a dilemma. Uh, every time I, when I, I make films, especially this one, oh. am I a journalist or am I, am I an artist? That's the question. It seems to me in, when it concerns documentary films, especially if it's uh, about people, history, people's behavior, I think should be then the artist. When, when you do, when you make film about animals, uh, nature, then you're an artist, I understand. But, but when it comes to people, I, I think w I'm, you, you, you should be more journalist and more objective than subjective about what you're doing. Interesting. It's, we, have, we got another question here. <coughs> Peter, your word, you started before all people were here and it's so interesting how you did this movie that I saw it this uh, Sunday in New York, it's a stunning movie. I think it's, it's do it during pandemic. I think it's like you are a hero. 
Well, you know, I, I call this uh, film we made on Rachmaninoff the pandemic movie because um, it had a history that really paralleled uh, the whole uh, pandemic. We, we did the film um, on a commission from uh, VDR, WDR, which is the German uh, public television. And um, that contract was completed and budget was completed. Uh, the proposals, everything that you discussed before you go ahead with a film, that was all completed by really the, uh, let's say January of last year. Um, I was in Berlin for the final meetings about the film in February and noticed just then, uh, mid-February, that the airports were a little different. Um, you know, flying was not quite the same. There were longer lines. Um, people were beginning to wear masks. This is uh, towards the end of February of 2020. And that's when I first had that very inkling in the back of my mind, maybe this project will be a little difficult to complete on schedule if um, things are going in this direction. The contract called for the delivery to VDR and to Arte, who were the broadcasters, um, in November of 2020. So we had, you know, what, not eight months to do, to do this project. Um, I began to realize when I got back to New York and it began to be early March that, um, and things were closing, that maybe this film wasn't going to get produced and get done in 2020, according to the contract. So I called up the people at VDR and Arte and I assumed uh, they knew about the pandemic. I assumed everybody would say, oh yes, we understand, but let's, let's postpone this for six months. Everyone said, no way, you have to deliver <laughs> this film um, on November 1st. 2020 when it's due. We have an air date of November 12th or 15th or something like that. So the absolute latest was early November. So we were faced with this um, six or seven month window to make the whole film. And I knew that was exactly the worst time of the pandemic, which as everybody knows, got uh, more and more serious as, as the days went on. Um, one very fortuitous thing happened was my office is in um, a building called the Duart Building, which is houses 12 stories of production facilities on uh, West 45th Street in Manhattan. Uh, sorry, West 55th Street in Manhattan. And um, all, the, all the other office buildings were closed. Um, so I, when I went to my office to see if we could begin to work on this project and get it done on time, I had trouble getting in. Uh, but a week later, Turns out all the doors are open uh, and people were flowing in and out of there as though there was no pandemic. And I found out that on the ninth floor of this building are their uh, sound studios, you know, the audio recording facilities. And Duart had gotten a contract with um, the Department of Health in New York City. And I think with the NIH in Washington, National Institute of Health to create um, you know, radio commercials, voiceover ads about the pandemic, about how you should go get tested. So because they were uh, recording PSA, you know, advertisements for radio on the testing, the building had permission to stay open. So this was very lucky for us because I'm on the third floor, the ninth floor was open, the building was open. So all the people that I generally work with on a uh, during the shooting stage, we did about, um, somebody asked earlier, um, uh, Marina maybe about the, what we were shooting. We actually had the music all completed. So we were just faced with shooting 10 or 12 interviews with pianists um, around the country and um, some in Europe. And we um, were able to do all of that work, bring in the camera crews. We were able to do all the post-production on time um, because our building was open. So we had color correct titles, graphics, sound mixing, all the things that you do when you're in, uh, in the editing phase um, were done on time right in the middle of the pandemic. And I very much appreciate, you know, I think at the screening, one of our editors was there, Hilan, and um, the co-producer was there. The narrator was there at the screening, which we had uh, on, on Saturday. Um, and I keep telling them how much I appreciate the fact that they all came in right in the heart of the pandemic, April, May, June, throughout the summer of 2020 to work on this project. Um, it was almost like um, showing off some bravery. I was very uh, interested to see how people would, you know, defy the laws, uh, the rules in New York City, which said stay home, only go out for essential things. All these guys uh, came to work.
almost every day during the whole uh, summer. So we were able to finish the film. That's why I call I call the Rachmaninoff film the pandemic film. I don't think I'll go through another production under the uh, similar circumstances. Um, but it made the project very interesting. And I always look at that project uh, thinking about those times. Um, now it's different. I mean, working on something now where there are absolutely no restrictions, everybody goes out and does whatever they do uh, as though it were uh, two years ago. When we were uh, try to organize uh, this year festival with Anna, um, it was pretty hard to uh, find um, appropriate space, uh, a good theater. Uh, as you uh, know, maybe that our main uh, theater at DCTV with John Alpert and A.K. Katsuna, uh, they decided uh, uh, do not open uh, their theaters and uh, that's the problem and uh, I suppose that the the next level problem for all documentary uh, filmmakers uh, where to screen am I right or not no you know I don't think it's true in many theaters um you know I'm in the uh, directors guild we have screenings every Wednesday and every Saturday of new films before they're released, usually um, two or three a day where the directors come or the cast comes and does the Q&A. This is a 600 seat theater on West 57th Street, which remained open pretty much. Um, you did have to call in and make a reservation and you had to wear a mask going in. Once you sat down, you didn't have to in the dark. But um, that theater for um, all this fall from September on was full and um, people sitting right next to each other. So I really think it depended on the venues. You know, the commercial theaters, movies were opening to full houses in New York. Some theaters were open, some, some were closed. But um, it really depends. That's what I was saying earlier. This pandemic is very strange to me because in some areas, in some venues, in some parts of the country, it's as though it never happened. And in other areas, it totally closed down life as we know it. It's the strangest thing about this pandemic that, uh, in, in my mind. Yeah. And now, uh, thank you. And uh, Nina, we are mm -hmm. waiting for you. Uh, actually, we came to idea to uh, discuss a little bit how to shoot during pandemic, what you shoot about and where to show your film. What different for you to shoot during the pandemic and before and after? And, uh, so th this film that was shown uh, in the Fresh Loop program uh, was made uh, in 2019. So it was before, a year before pandemic. But actually I made another film that was also, I called it my pandemic called his project but it was very small it was also 15 minutes uh, also short film uh, I mean not also as Peter's project but also as my project short film uh, and I worked uh, on it uh, during uh, 2020 it was um, for me it was a kind of uh, uh, important project because uh, um, I started it just in the beginning the end of uh, uh, um, uh, 2019, I came up with the idea, with everything, and uh, we made the principal uh, filmography uh, at the very, very beginning of uh, 2020, February, and in, uh, the very beginning of March, uh, here in New York. And it's a New York project, and it everything was made only in New York. And it's about uh, a three months. It is called Married to Mass. Actually, uh, I wanted to show it in this festival, but it didn't happen somehow. I hope to show it maybe next year. Marina, I hope, yeah, it will be possible, right? And uh, it is, <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, it's. <laughs> I I believe it's an interesting film and uh, it's a short film, 15, uh, 17 minutes now, 17 minutes. And uh, it is called Married to Mass. It's about three mathematicians, uh, 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 all from the Soviet, ex-Soviet Union, who came to USA when they were very, very young, like 17 years, and uh, as mathematicians, very talented, and made their 
career as mathematicians here uh, in New York. Uh, but then somehow they decided to uh, try themselves as um, uh, artists. And uh, they always wanted to be, uh, to be the artist, always. And one became a very popular now musician composer, uh, Alexei Shore, maybe you know him, maybe Peter Rosen heard him. Uh, have you heard about Alexei Shore, uh, composer? <laughs> No, uh, no. He he is now performed pretty widely uh, uh, around the world. Recently, there were there was a show in Dubai. So well, uh, whatever. So he uh, he is like classic uh, type of musician, classic type. Uh, and then uh, another um, one uh, uh, become, uh, and she was from her childhood, a visual artist. And uh, based on her visuals, there is uh, the uh, narrative. And uh, the other uh, uh, character is uh, uh, the writer. Uh, based on her narrative, on her story, on her book, uh, which is called Fire of the... Uh, a dark triad uh, uh, that I made compilation uh, is the story and the story it's actually a science fiction book and somehow this um, uh, the writer Asya Semenovich she forecasted uh, she envisioned the pandemic uh, in 20. Uh, 18 when she uh, was uh, writing this book. Uh, of course, there was not, uh, well, a trace of pandemic in the air. And when I, I was thinking of this film, there was also not trace because I was writing uh, uh, this uh, story, uh, this compiling the story and writing the script. Uh, it was 2000, the mid of 2019. And then, when the film was in the process, the pandemic started. So it was like a kind of, uh, well, prediction. The kind pandemic. of prediction. Yeah, that's why I wanted to show it this year, but it did not happen. But it was showed in different festivals anyway. So I was happy for the, his, uh, for the history of screening of this film. And uh, so I worked also, I worked, but the film is very low budget, very low budget. I could not manage to find a good um, uh, a financing uh, interest. I couldn't... Um, uh, interest some big companies uh, in financing this film, so I just find some. So you think it was because of pa pandemia, like it's hard to find financing, harder than regular? No, because it's Russian. It's Russians and uh, now Russian topic. Uh, contemporary Russians are not that very popular. Maybe because of my energy, I was not very energetic in finding money. And it were only three, four people. It was very camera, like how to say, very small film, very close film, you know, and not a lot of people working on it. So, so somehow I was not very, uh, maybe energetic in, <clears throat> Uh, putting my um, uh, energy in finding uh, finances. Uh, so, but I found something and that's why, uh, and a lot of people worked just pro bono on, uh, on this film. And, uh, but we worked also the whole pandemic, mostly in my apartment, uh, but we uh, shot uh, outside, of course, and uh, uh, there was, um, it is mostly a film, or man, as we say, montage film, editing film, film or, uh, based on the montage, uh, uh, on editing. Uh, and uh, so it's not a lot of uh, things that we had to do outside, but we did, uh, uh, 
um, sound recording outside, of course, filming outside and uh, color correction outside. And uh, then we started to work virtually uh, um, like uh, uh, on, on di distant, uh, we made um, uh, post recordings uh, also. Uh, so so uh, now it will be easier next year to do something, I okay? think we, it has uh, more, yeah. more possibilities. If you succeeded to do it like now, I believe, Lucy, what do you think about it? You hear yeah, how? You hear our okay. directors, what do you think about possibilities for directors? You ask director too. Yes, but I, uh, I'm very, very independent. <laughs> I really do my own thing. And, uh, and I think uh, during the pandemic, uh, the present project I'm working on is about my uncle Andre Castellanos. You probably know what in this room has heard of, except maybe uh, Peter Rosen. Uh, but uh, when I was growing up, he was a household name, he was an orchestra conductor. And, uh, but he, was born in St. Petersburg, Russia in 1901. He came, I should say, escaped in 1922 and never went back. Um, so, and, and he was never, his, his records were never played in Russia. So no one, no one would have heard of him, but he was internationally famous at one point. But I work, uh, I'm working only with primary source material. So there, and I do my own initial editing on Adobe Premiere. And so I just loved, um, you know, being having the time to just be single-minded about it as much as I could, and and I I can sort of sketching uh, the story. I have his um, voice uh, at the end of his life. Mm -hmm. I was um, talking uh, with his um, ghostwriter. He was doing his autobiography, and then he suddenly died in in 1980 in January. Uh, so it's it, I'm using that as the narrative spine and his how he filtered his life at the end of his life, which was a pretty fascinating life. But what was sort of fun about editing is that I could just sort of pull images from anywhere just for now, just to sort of sketch out uh, the story. So that was kind of my um, my focus and it's been, I've really enjoyed it because <laughs> the hard part is the clearances and all that other kind of stuff. But, and I have now a question, like, uh, you like oh. a, a jury member. This yeah. year, we already one year after pandemic and you, uh, you was like last year and a member of jury as well. Yes, you like kind of difference in the movies and the topics in the dynamic of movies for this year, or you know, just um, well, I really missed getting together, you know, as a jury, I really did being in the same room and talking through everything, which we can't do, we couldn't do, and we did, we did have a Zoom last year, and I did talk with Jeff this year, so I do. Yeah, it's very important to me. I like to uh, hear other people's response and and uh, go, go through a kind of a process. So I hopefully that- um, We'll do next year. I yeah, yes. I mean, I think that's important to do. Um, and uh, at least I've always, as, as a part of the process, I've really enjoyed greatly. And I learn, I learn from other people. Sometimes I'm the only American in the room and also the, <laughs> only the non-Russians. It, it, well, I mean, I'm sure it was, it's, it, it's just been harder to do, uh, you know, to do the things we, the way we used to do them, but hopefully we'll return. I just recommend that it's important to get together as a jury, but um, I'm, I'm sure we, but I ha I'm happy we were helpful, nevertheless. <laughs> yeah. I agree with Lucy, uh, yeah. Lucy. I think that it's very important. The physical contacts is yeah, very, yes, important. It is. It's oh, nice. very important. It's very uh, nice, for, yeah. Especially yeah. Uh, under the project, uh, festival project. Yes, And yes, uh, I would like to ask uh, Anna Graham. Uh, um, so um, when, we, um, when we talk about uh, cinema project uh, or festival project, uh -huh. I feel how traditional formats, uh, traditional genres, uh, not destroy, but transform um, into some new forms. And you uh, spent a lot of time inside art world uh, mm -hmm. as a representative of an, an Izvestny state. Uh, what what uh, in your world, uh, how it transform, or maybe it's, um, it don't transform during the pandemic years? It's uh, funny that 
my ability as a translator were not requested because you're all so accomplished. <laughs> but that you're person. All so, accomplished. <laughs> so my Russian is sleeping in the back burner. Anyway, um, I believe that whatever was said in the world of cinematography would 100% relate to the world of the arts. It was uh, at standstill for a very long while. And then uh, a lot of galleries closed because they could not resist the lack of uh, visitors. And uh, nonetheless, there are projects that are ongoing. Uh, the last one I heard of was uh, back to school art show where Jeff Blumis, the creator of the award has participated. So uh, it's springing back to life. That's all I can say. As far as sales concern, it's another story. It was always hard, especially in a limited edition, high priced art. And uh, now it's as complicated as pulling teeth without an aesthetic. Coming oh, from Russia, we all know what it's like. Yeah, we are. <laughs> okay. Now, as far as the award, uh, I believe some 10 years ago, Marina, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you called Ernst, my late husband, who is not with us for the last five years, and asked him to give a drawing or a sketch that would represent the logo of the Russian Documentary Festival. And uh, he came to me <laughs> for an advice. And uh, among others, I chose uh, his drawing of the prophet, the biblical prophet, holding a tree of life, the eternal symbol in his hand in the shape of a human heart. So that became the symbol of the festival. And then his... Uh, a dear friend and a student, Jeff Loomis, who has his own foundry, created a three, based on, on that drawing, he created a three-dimensional work that became the award for the festival. The Grand Prix. Uh, the yeah. Grand Prix, Grand yeah. Prix I believe Nina was talking about mathematicians that eventually became musicians or, well, in Jeff's case, he holds a master's degree from Berkeley in mathematics. He didn't work one day in his field after meeting Nis Vesna at Columbia, where my husband was reading lectures, became an artist. And he's a member of jury, by the way. I know. That was <laughs> my advice. That was my Marina asked me. I said, no, 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 Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff is doing all no, the hard work. Them. All I do is I, I, I watch the movies. I watch the product, final product. So that's the story. Yeah, the story. I have one more question to all of uh, participants about distribution under the pandemic. Uh, what do you think? Uh, is it this same? Yeah, it's like art, art sales distribution, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, streaming has taken off. I have a film now on seven platforms. <laughs> seven. Oh, great. Oh, thank, thank international. You. I mean, God really. For, uh, yeah, for um, and my, the group, my Florida uh, Film Seminar, they did an online uh, festival this year. Usually they have about 176 uh, participants in the live one. This year they had online. Uh, 400 people had uh, participated uh, from 40 countries. So that is pretty extraordinary. Uh, and they're gonna try to continue live and online at the same time, they're gonna try to figure that out. So it really has opened up a lot of possibilities. So screaming is amazing. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the fact that we can look at each other. Yes, right, each right. Other, yes, right, you know? yes. 
from all the different courts. It's a, to me, to my generation, it's a miracle. Yeah, it is amazing. I, I'm with you. <laughs> it took Marina's husband about 45 minutes to guide stupid me uh -huh. on how to install Zoom. Uh -huh, right, right. And I told him it would be easier for me to learn second piano uh, yeah. concerto by Rachmaninoff than to install Zoom. He said, not nearly. Mm -hmm. Just listen to what I say yeah. and press the button. Right, good. Well, Marina, what is, in terms of audience, how has the streaming, uh, how has it helped? Has it helped the festival? Has it broadened your audience? Um, in my opinion, uh, yes. Uh, we, uh, we, we, um, uh, we use two types uh, to talk with audience, online theater, as you know, and uh, physical theater uh -huh. in the School of Visual Art. Right. So it's quite different uh, experience. Uh, online uh, theater uh, was uh, very exciting and very popular and very good as a result. Mm -hmm. uh, we started uh, these online screenings uh, two, three years ago, uh, first before the pandemic as a pilot program, and it was uh, it had uh, with success, and uh, and uh, uh, now it was uh, very successful. Um, maybe on uh, j just continue this, but we do uh, have a problem with a physical theater. Uh, we uh, would like uh, to uh, come back to New York. Uh, it's very important, as I uh, already um, as I said, uh, the contact is very important for us. Festival is uh, uh, the real physical contacts with audience, with our viewers. Uh, we uh, would like to listen to them, uh, to to see them, and uh, but unfortunately, uh, uh, people uh, people um, visitors in the physical uh, theaters in Manhattan. Um, Sometimes um, they uh, do not want to wear uh, masks. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's pretty hard experience uh, to, 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 to have a covered face and breathe, try to breathe for five hours. Uh, and um, um, nobody wants it. Uh, it's a uh, um, vaccination. There are, uh, there are a lot of problems uh, linked to pandemic. And uh, the festival organizers uh, feel it and uh, know it very well. Anna, maybe, uh, maybe your opinion, yes. Yeah, yeah I, I'd like to add a few more yeah, uh, <laughs> thoughts about, yeah, about uh, this the new formats that we got uh, throughout yeah. the pandemic. So, uh, we, so the pandemic moved to, to move part of the festival on a digital platform. So we could stream, well, not stream, but we can show films online. And uh, that's why this is, our content is accessible to more people throughout the world. So we looked up statistics and the number of our viewers increased so much, enormously. So now we had, uh, Marina, yeah, last uh, yesterday, so we checked, we had 25,000 clicks from different countries on the website. And uh, this is uh, just, and people, they're very interested to watch films uh, in the frames of the festival. And um, they could access it from different countries. That's a benefit. And uh, uh, of course, uh, human contact is very important and festival, this is the festival when people want to see each other and talk on professional subjects. So, uh, uh, so we really hope so that uh, next year, so we'll have more in person uh, venues and uh, to meet. Uh, but you're yeah. going to continue doing both? Yeah. We try, we try, we try yeah, to continue yeah. both forums. Yeah. Yes, yes. It's very important. To say I see. Peter, you want to say something? Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, I think um, I understand all the benefits of this of the uh, pandemic opening up some of the streaming possibilities, especially 
for example, in your case. But you know, for um, for documentaries and for the filmmaker, the uh, theatrical run is is still the most important aspect of it. Uh, film festivals and uh, the theatrical, because number one, um, you calculate your income. <laughs> you know, everybody pays ten dollars to go to the theater and buy the ticket, and the box office splits that fifty fifty with the distributor. And hopefully the distributor doesn't keep more than 25 or 35 percent of that box office and the rest goes to the filmmaker. Um, I don't think um, maybe different, Lucy, with you, if you have it on quite a few platforms, but I don't know too many filmmakers that have really made back any real money from streaming. That's true. That's true. You're right. You know, even some of the hot, the most popular films on Netflix, I, you know, a friend of mine produced the, the Born, what is it, the Born Identity, you know, that series of films about the detective Born. Mm -hmm. um, which, which is, you know, a hundred, two hundred million dollar production. The guy has only made a few thousand dollars back from Netflix. You're, you're, you're actually right. You're absolutely right. Years that those yeah. films have been on there. So nobody is making any income from streaming. Um, on the other hand, it's a wonderful opening to the, to a global audience that never existed before, and I think that's very positive. Um, the other thing about the hits on the websites is very misleading. Um, you know, the average time that people, when they're, when they're surfing the web, stop on a website is seven seconds. So when you calculate all the hits, it's, it's probably averaging out at about 10 seconds per person, which is not bad. I mean, they get an impression of what the website's all about, what a different, different film festival may be all about, but um, it's not really a concentrated effort. And when a filmmaker, I'm sure, you know, Lucy and Semyon would agree, you want your audience to come in at the beginning of the film, sit in a dark room with not too many distractions like the telephone going off and people eating food and people running around your living room while something's on a screen. You want them to be in a theater where they watch your film from beginning to end. And that doesn't happen with streaming. Uh, it never happens with, with a screen, with a film that's- Absolutely streaming. agreed. Hmm. Yeah, would, so I'm not my, too excited. My question my, to you my, guys, uh, could I have a uh, uh, possibility to watch it on the web? <laughs> could yeah, I receive, you know, the, I can, I can could I receive the link? I would gladly pay $10 yeah. <laughs> per yeah. viewing, but you, um, you're absolutely right. There, there's some inc there's some very good new uh, income uh, producing streaming platforms. We recently have been talking to people at um, Vimeo about what they call OTT, over the top, which means a direct link to the viewer who pays whatever you put on the screen. You can say, I want $2 to rent this and $5 to buy it or whatever you set the prices. And you are then presenting your work for a certain amount of dollars per screening. And when people pay that, then they're gonna want their money's worth and hopefully they would you know, watch a complete film, no matter how exciting it may be, they still tend to turn it off halfway through if they haven't uh, really paid for it. So that's all. Uh, um, what do you do sometimes uh, we'll Amazon, the the when you mm -hmm. want to see some movie that you don't have on Netflix or free platform, you can pay for Amazon Prime like a few dollars. And get it's a membership per service. viewing. Yep. People do it's it. a membership service. And I, my yeah. own experience is the pay per view, people didn't want to do it. I mean, they seem to, but maybe it'll come back. No. Uh, the, and the, uh, no, no filmmakers are making any money from Amazon Prime. I'm yeah. Sure Amazon right. is doing okay. Right. Um, you know, but um, the filmmakers don't make any income from that. So the, the old traditional box office, which actually is proven to be um, lit alive, you know, a lot of the major films that are coming out are opening in theaters at the same time that they're on HBO Max or on Disney Plus. Um, and they find that uh, more people are going to see the film in the theater um, as would stay home and watch it on their screen even when they open on the same day. So there is some real attraction that people have to go to see these projects in the theater. And I think because the, the benefits of that are so immense that in the long run, five years from now, we'll look back on this conversation about streaming platforms and it'll all seem kind of ridiculous that we put a lot of faith into it when, when the full theatrical uh, you know, distribution possibilities come back. And many of the distributors that we've worked with were kind of lying low for the last year and a half and they really all have big pl acquisition plans now in the coming years for 
um, contracts that are theatrical release only, especially for documentaries, which are playing very well in, in, uh, in theaters. If you look at box office results around America, I'm not sure this is really the case outside of America, mm -hmm. but if you look at the American box office, documentaries seem to do um, better than expected compared to most independent you know, dramatic features in, in, the, in theatrical runs. So I still have my faith in that. We hope to you know, get films shown at, in, in New York. We have Film Forum and Cinema Village and The Quad and so many other wonderful small theaters. And you know, every small town in America has an art house. Um, some of them were torn down over the years, but still there's always a film society they're young people who love movies and, and create their own film societies. They've bought these old art houses, fix them up, and they're always looking for product. And the big breakthrough technically is not so much streaming, but the fact that the films are now just on simple DCP files, you know, which is a little drive that can fit in your back pocket and the whole movie can be on that file. So when it's distributed to theaters, it just comes in the mail. You don't have uh, Technicolor developed delivering these uh, six or eight huge heavy cans of the film to the theater projectionists every week. Now it's a much simpler way to uh, put the movie into theaters. So all that to me is much more promising than, than the streaming uh, aspect of it all. So it's why I think Marina and Anna will keep festival in two uh, different versions. Online, uh, for whom, for people who like streaming, <laughs> and for people who like yeah. come to, uh, it's true. I came now to see uh, movie alive in different different uh, impression. But what can you do? Yeah, this is a progress, and we can. And you, know, you don't have to wear the mask in there. I mean, it's it's all dark. I mean, who who knows whether you're wearing a mask or not? <laughs> you know, it's With the dark. Book, you for sure don't have to do it. <laughs> Can anyone speak to uh, how uh, documentaries and the jury and participations? We have our hour. If you really want to say <laughs> something, you have few minutes. Or if not, Marina and Anna will say you nice goodbye for, and we will wait for next year festival.